Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. Jesus, we ask that you would anoint the word, anoint the hearts, anoint my mouth. I also ask, Lord, that you would answer the cries of our heart, the groanings that cannot be uttered. Continue to give us the prayers to pray and the words to speak and the, and the direction that we need, Lord, from our spirit, from your spirit. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would part the Red Sea, move the clouds, change the climate, whatever you got to do, but do it. And we give ourselves to you, Lord, as willing vessels to be recipients of your power, of the rain, of the anointing, of the Spirit, Lord. We thank you in advance, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you know, we're in the middle of a message that I thought might be a one-day message, but of course, wasn't. And that's probably good because it's a tough enough topic to swallow in bite sizes. This is part two of the sermon entitled, Powerless. Powerless. You might say, in a certain sense, we have pneumonia, not pneuma. We sneeze. We have outbursts of God doing things at times. But we do not have the full, flowing, functional rivers of living water that bubble forth in great geysers with lots of pressure taking place all throughout the body of Christ. We are not waterless, but neither are we powerful enough to drive a dam, channel the electricity. We have creeks and build churches around them. We have ponds and rejoice over revivals. We dig ditches waiting for the rain to come, and we look up to the sky, and then we say, well, it was a nice exercise, digging ditches, but there's no water in the ditches. Somehow, some way, either God has made a mistake, the devil has won the fight, or we are responsible. Somehow, some way, Somehow, some way, well, Lord, if it be thy will, somehow, some way. If thou wouldst desire, Lord, thy church to be blessed with almighty power, well, you probably can't do that yet anyway because most of us couldn't handle it. Most of us are incapable. There's too much pride in the church. There's too much arrogance in the church. There's too much naivete in the church. I don't think there's enough vessels, Lord, for you to fill up with power. Maybe we don't have enough vessels in the church. We have a billion reasons and a half <laughs> as to why the power of God cannot abide, operate, and flow. And those who don't have those excuses take their planes, as it were, up to Mach 1, honestly believing they got some power behind those engines having never flown at that speed before, there are accidents. And whenever there's an accident, man of God falls, woman of God falls, music minister falls, anybody who's got any kind of anointing falls, the rest of the people on the sidelines go, yeah, that's what I thought. Man was not meant to fly. That's the problem. Man was not meant to go to the moon. That's the problem. Man was not meant to go to the depths of the sea. That's the problem. Man should not be tinkering around with nuclear power. That's the problem. We've had our Chernobyls. We've had our Apollo 13s. We've had our train wrecks, our two-car collisions, our pileups, our freeway crashes. Yep, better that we go back to the days of peaceful, quiet camels walking across the desert. At least then it was safe. 
spiritually safe. The land never moved. The camel was always a camel. The caravan was always tight-knit and close. And it took us a while to get to our destination, but that was good enough. We became powerless right after the apostles. We stayed powerless long after the apostles. And when the reformers started to come into the awareness of grace, mercy, and forgiveness, and a little bit of power, those who were dead said, we'll solve this one. We'll just burn them, fry them, sink them, torture them, stretch them, pull them, bang them, dust them, scatter their ashes across the water, we'll revile them, defile them, assault them, declare them unclean. Then we got more sophisticated. We locked them up in insane asylums and gave them electric shop therapy. Because after all, anybody who believes that they talk to God, surely, surely people who talk to God are nuts. Okay, we finally accept the fact of the possibility that maybe God does talk to people periodically on occasion, but certainly not any of this repeatedly talking to you on a regular basis stuff. Okay, maybe some of you get to hear from God, but not the rest of us. Okay, maybe more of us get to hear from God than we thought, but not all of us. Okay, maybe healing is possible today, but it really ceased at the time of the apostles, and I'm not quite sure how you're doing it, but okay. We have a billion reasons in the universe to slow God down as a church, as a body. What made the church powerless in Christ's day? Do we have any carryover to today? Are there any similarities that have taken and caused us to be exactly what I just said we became? Oh, but there's a lot of things going on out there. You're just not in the right places. The very fact that you have to say I'm not in the right places tell me that my answer is right. If Christ's body is not flowing with power from stem to stern, from toe to nose, across the planet, we are power less. The fact that we have to go for a seminar for a thousand bucks to find out somewhere on the other side of planet Gaza <laughs> how it is to yield to God. The fact that we have to hop a plane and fly clear across the country to go to a seminar on you too can hear the voice of God. The very fact that I can't walk down the street to the local church and say Please, I need five good elders to come to my house, according to Scripture, to anoint the sick and pray for them that they might be instantly healed. And if, their sins, if they have sins, their sins will be forgiven them. And I can't do that. Shows me we are still powerless. If I can't look across the way and see a man standing up and just casting out devils and healing the sick and doing that in Jesus' name and he's not part of us, then we are still powerless. I am not being judgmental, critical, or evaluating on the basis of hurt. I am saying, look around. In a time period when God is pouring out His Spirit trying to say, Look at me, I'm over here. Look at me, I'm over here. Look at me, I'm over here. Look what I can do with a man. Look what I can do with a lady. Look what I can do with the church. Look what I can do with the people. Look, look, look. Poof, two years later, not there. Poof, two years later, not there. The revival is gone. The ministers who were in the center of that revival are now traveling around the world. The places where the revival stopped, they're still doing a Jericho march. do, 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 do. do. Still some results, still some goodness. But along come the investigative reporters coming up from behind, looking over the scene, saying, so, what do we really have here? And their answer is carcasses. Their answer is graveyards. Their answer is, if it was such a great move of God, where hath it been? It tells us we're still not up to bringing that needle up on the Geiger counter of power to where it's getting closer to the red zone and we have to worry about explosion rather than to the other side where we worry about the car is going to stall on the freeway! 
I just wanted you to get the feel for it. Now let's talk a little bit more about the reason for it. What made the church powerless in Christ's day? <clears throat> Answer? Whited sepulchers, i.e. dead men walking. This is what Jesus said. Matthew 23:27. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye are like whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead bones. King James says dead men's bones. It's actually in italics in mine. Dead bones. Dead bones, dead bones, nothing but dead bones. And of all uncleanness. And of all uncleanness. Whew. Uncleanness? I have no uncleanness. I have kept the law from my youth. What do I yet lack? You're powerless! Uh, what else? <laughs> you don't hear the voice of God! Uh, what else? I have been a good soul. You cannot say to me that God isn't going to give me what I want because I've been a good soul. Powerless! I don't need the Holy Ghost. I had it the moment I got born again instantly. Poof. Where's your power then? It says, ye shall be endued with power when you receive the Holy Ghost. Where's your power then? Oh no, that doesn't mean power. That means empowered. That means motivated. That means I now have the boldness to share Christ. Dead bones, dead bones. You are full of dead bones. You walk around in your robes. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Don't you get it? You're beautiful. Look at those churches, man. Ever been to a large church during Mass? I have. My relatives live in Munich. They come by the droves. And it's a vast, big building. And all the people are nicely dressed because you don't come to church badly dressed. That's a bad thing. You're not supposed to come in front of God badly dressed. And there's a truth to that and there's a not truth to that. <laughs> okay? There's decorous. We thank thee, O Lord, that we are not as that man. And there's undecorous. <gasps> oh, God! There's reverent. Holy, holy, holy. And there's not reverent. Yippee, God is with me, yeah! Mm, 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 mm. Yippee, God is with me, yeah! Mm, 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 mm. Dead bones. Live bones. Nothing wrong with some of those bones. Live bones. What I'm trying to say here is beautiful for spacious guys and churches made of brick and little places like our church who want to see it thick. <laughs> okay, so I'm a little on the musical side this morning. We want the presence of God to be our power, to be our strong tower, our buckler, our shield, our whatever. But the problem is, the reason we're powerless in the church is because we're looking at the wrong thing. Master, Master, behold, the temple, the temple, such a great thing, don't you think? This place won't stand one brick upon another in a short while. In three days and three nights, I'll destroy it. Actually, I'm talking about myself, but you won't get it. Oh, please, how many people are in your church? I would to God we were 10,000 strong. 10,000 strong live people with power is worth something. 10,000 strong dead people with no power is pretty. Oh, be nice. Be nice. Whited sepulchers, holy sepulchers, clean sepulchers. Our grave diggers are the best in the world. We know how to put up tombstones with some of the most ornate phrases. We know how to make them black them. We know how to make them statues. We know how to make them icons. We know how to make them, make them, make them. We can make it gorgeous. We can make them stained glass. 
Just tell us what kind of reverence would you like. Tell me what the image of God should be, and I will make it for you. Tell me what Jesus looks like. Tell me how he hammered people on the cross. Tell me what he looked like when he was laying down. Show me. What about Jesus really manifesting? What about the power really flowing? Oh, we write books about the healing power of Jesus' ministry. We write treatises on how wonderful that was, and it testified of the goodness of the gospel, and we make it about that thick. And we put our references in it, and our cross-references in it, and our theological abstracts in it, and we make sure it's in good wording that most people can't read. And then we drop it on the table. There you go. I have written you a book about Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. Wonderful, isn't it great? It's wonderful. Scribes, scribes, everywhere are scribes. <laughs> I know, I'm not going to sing the tune. Scribes, writers, writers, scribes. Lots of scribing going on. Lots of scribing going on. <coughs> Lots of Phariseeing going on. Well, I think what we need to do in order to balance the move of God is we need to write these laws a certain way. See, the problem is we can't afford to be captured again by our adversary, thrown back into Babylon, taken over again. So what we need to do is make laws around laws around laws around laws around laws to make sure that our people are nice and safe. Because after all, we all know that when God does things, that's always going to be safe. It's not going to be shocking. He's not going to do any of that throw people on the floor stuff. That's not safe. We're not going to have them standing in trances for three days. That's not safe. We can't possibly have visions and dreams because, you know, that's nutsy. That's not safe. We are the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees. We've been around for a while. We are the establishment. And just who do you think you are, Carpenter's son, anyway? Hmm? Just who do you think you are, John the Baptist, anyway? By whose authority do you come in here and say, you, sir, need to be baptized now? Get in the water. And just who do you think you are to tell me I have to dip in the River Jordan seven times in that muddy river to get my healing? You're the prophet. You're supposed to just pray for me and I'm supposed to be well, says Nam to the prophet. It's not different today. Uh, yes, Pastor, I'd like you to... It's part of a conversation, believe it or not, I just had. I'm paraphrasing, rewording a little bit. But uh, yes, Mr. So-and-so, yes, we'd like you to marry us. We'd like you to marry us. But uh, we don't want you using the name of Jesus. We can't have you praying over us. We don't want to have any religious rituals, but we'd like you to marry us. <coughs> Dead. Dead people. Dead people. This is going to sound like a tangent. I don't know why I'm putting it in here, really. I saw something this week on eBay. I was actually going to print it and show it to you. I, I clipped it. Because it was it was so poignantly painful. You know, browsing through eBay, looking at Bible programs. And up comes this ad that says, and I can't quote it perfectly because it was poorly written, for sale, Bible, cheap, doesn't work, bid here. Gives a little paragraph explanation. I, lay, I, I read certain, and it's in bad English at that, I read certain verses, I asked God give me millions, he gave me nothing. I read other verses, I believe what they say, nothing happened. I read these verses, yada yada, nothing happened. Bible cheap, 1911 edition of the King James. Here, you can have it, bid on it. Opening bid, 99 cents. Now, how does that strike you? Grievous. Shocking. Mind-boggling. This is a book that people have died for. And you know what the soul was saying in essence? Little twisted, probably demonic. <laughs> Certainly illiterate the way it was written. But the point was sitting there. Here. Powerless. Doesn't work. Does your Bible work or doesn't it work? Does your God work or doesn't he work? powerless. Gave it a try. It doesn't work. Here, I'm going to sell it cheap on eBay. Yeah, yeah, I tried that anointing oil stuff. 
Just a bunch of olive oil. Here, catch. Give it to you for 50 cents. Whereas the sorcerer said, Tell me what price must I pay you that I might have this power that people be, when I lay hands on them, receive the Holy Ghost like you gave them. What price? We now say, stupider than a magician, not of any value, non-essential. Scribes, Pharisees, and key word here is hypocrites. Oh, there's a lot of hypocrites in the church. Yes, there are. I don't want to fellowship with hypocrites. Well, let me tell you what this word hypocrites really means. It means putting on a mask. Putting on a show. Ladies and gentlemen, here he comes, John, whippity, whippity, snippity, snippity, with 16,000 degrees of behind his name. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage. Then there's this other fellow that walks on. This is Pastor So-and-so. He'll be preaching the message today. Thank you. Hi, guys. How you doing? Hi, John. How you doing? Good to see you guys. Good to see you again. Haven't been around for a while, huh? Well, let's see what the Lord's going to do today. Shall we go up to the mountain and see what the Lord will do today? Let's go up to the mountain and see what the Lord will do today. There's a difference. There's a difference in the tone, the tenor, the flavor. There's no mask. There's no mask. There's no robes of pomposity and proof of my anointing. There's no dead men's bones either. I'm trying to say that I saw something. I saw why, even in Christ's day, the Son of God is walking into the middle of the scene of dead. And they had the audacity to look at him and say, you cast out devils by Beelzebub. I felt like saying, and what discerning gift are you operating? statement I made yesterday in talking about the minister and the, and the, and the marriage thing, just because of the way it struck me, as I said, if somebody walks up to a minister and says, please marry me, and then gives the minister a whole bunch of rules and reasons of what he can't do, the real question should be, why did you come to me in the first place? What you doing here? You walk up to a man of God, you better expect that the man of God, woman of God, is going to get you. Somebody you walk up to says, I'm a prophet, you better watch yourself, he might be a prophet. You don't want to walk up to a prophet and say, Who do you think you are? And have your finger go withering up your near elbow. If he's powerful. You don't want to be the guy pointing at Paul, the apostle, and while Paul's gone out of town, rail on him and tell him bad things. And, you know, Paul, he doesn't know what he's talking about, and I know better than these doctors. i got it all figured out. And have Paul write you an epistle that's going to be famous for 2,000 years to say, We'll see when I come back home just exactly what kind of message you're preaching there. But you see, we can do that now because we're powerless. Hey, I can criticize any man of God. Oh, you can't say, don't touch mine anointed, do my prophets no harm. We all have the right to judge and evaluate to decide. Sure, because he isn't going to go, you, quiet for a season. He's not going to do a William Branham and the guys running down the aisle and go, you have interrupted the Lord, down, and have the guy hit the floor. Getting where I'm going? There's something stirring in me. There's something stirring in me that says, Bible college is nice. Church services are nice. Fellowship is nice. Pretty is nice. I pray to God we are not becoming dead men's bones. See, we're so worried about and all uncleanness. We're spending all our time worrying about trying to clean up the church. We're spending all the time trying to figure out how to sweep it all out, clean out that sepulcher, make sure it's all nice and clean. Don't want to mess up the testimony of Christ here. Make sure that tombstone has no dust on it. And while we're busily doing that, we have the form of godliness and denying the power thereof. We are not rivers of living water. We are pools of reverent, quiet still. Matthew 23.13 adds the next statement. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering in to go in. Let me put that to you in mer mer murden, murden, modern vernacular. 
You saw the Holy Ghost start to move and you said, stop that. You quenched it. You shut it down. Then, you hypocrites, scribes, and Pharisees, not only said to those people who were in the back corner on Wednesday night, trying to find God and get into the heavenlies, you said, I'm sorry, but we're going to lock the door on this one. We don't need it in our church. I'm going to turn the key. You want to do that kind of stuff? You go down the street. The Holy Ghost wanted to bust in on men. Jesus said the violent are taking it by force. But you guys, what do you guys do? How do you know the difference between a church that's moving on with God and a church that's not? The sound of the clicking of a lock on the door that shuts them out. Can you walk up to a, a local pastor and say, point blank, in all honesty, uh, Pastor, I'm, I'm visiting, I'm in town, um, I'm going to be here for a few weeks, I'm going to be attending your assembly because you're the, the closest thing to where I'm staying, and uh, just because it's proper of me to do so, I need to announce myself and tell you who I am. Uh, I am prophet so-and-so, I've been working for the Lord for the last 42 years, I'll be sitting in your assembly, um, just forewarning you in the event that the Lord should happen to use me for some reason that I'm not aware of at the moment because I really didn't come here to be ministered to or minister. I just came to, you know, hang out with you. But I, I just needed to warn you in advance. How many pastors would go, thank you for that. I appreciate that. We'll be watching to see what the Lord does. How many pastors would even for two seconds entertain the possibility that the guy knows what he's talking about? that he really is what he says he is? Or do we have to put him through a 2.3, 5-point year evaluation status? Okay, well, we'll test you out a few times. We'll see how you work. If Jesus Christ himself walked into the synagogue and was handed the scroll today, and he said, This day, end time prophecy number 442 has been fulfilled in your ears. How many people go, well, I'm not sure. Is that the correct interpretation? Is that the way it's supposed to be? How do we know that? I mean, how do we really know you know that? Did you ever go to the School of the Prophets? Were you ever a member of the Scribal? Uh, are you part of the Pharisee Committee? Are you part of the FOP, the Fraternity of Pharisees? I just need to know. What's your credentials? Where are you from? How you do it? Oh, well, I'm just baptizing the Holy Ghost, filled with fire, and, you know, God uses me, and told me one day when I was 12 that I was going to be this, and at 25 he told me I was going to do that, and 32 he told me I was going to do this, and that's what I'm supposed to do. Oh, I understand. Okay, sure. Well, I tell you what, why don't you sit in the back pew for a little while? Well, don't want to ruffle the sheep too bad. You know, they can't quite handle it. Uh, we're not saying don't, don't move in God. I mean, keep your prayers to yourself. Understand, prayers are personal. Uh, but uh, we're not sure they're ready to enter in yet. We're not sure they're ready to enter in yet. Don't you catch the irony in that? They're not ready to enter in yet. They're not ready to enter in yet. Uh, we will determine when they are capable to find God. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. See, in the old days, the dead church took the Bible and chained it to the pulpit. And somebody came along and broke that chain and put that Bible out there. It was a terrifying thing to the people of the day. Oh no, commoners are going to be reading the Bible and interpreting it for themselves. God is going to be pandemonium. Yep, it was. They were right. The fear was right. we got more doctrines and denominations now than ever. See, proof! Ah, but out of that has come God moving. Well now, we wouldn't dare chain our Bible to a pulpit, would we? But we will chain the foot of anybody who thinks they're operating in the Spirit to the pew! Because we're powerless. We are afraid. We have become fearful. And we are sons and daughters of the fearful. And we've been bred to be fearful. Because what we always hear is, Today in the news, another plane crashed. We shouldn't be flying. Today in the news. So-and-so couldn't handle the pressure of the ministry. Had to dump that church. Marriage couldn't take it. Kids couldn't take it. Friends couldn't take it. Nobody can take it. When people start operating like that, nobody can handle it. Let's go back to quiet. 
It's a sad thing to realize that the Pharisees of the day were shutting the kingdom of heaven. And so it is to this day. The common people hear Jesus gladly. But it's not an icon we want to hand to them. It's the icon we want to hand to them. <laughs> the Pharisees and Sadducees made the church powerless because they were wrapped up in a merry-go-round spin of disputation over spiritual things. Acts 23.8 says, The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither an angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Let's have another debate about this subject. Let's debate the rapture. Let's debate whether angels exist or not. Are they part of this temporal realm or not? Can non-corporeal beings touch corporeal space? Let's debate that again. Ah, there is no resurrection. Nobody's ever raised from the dead. Have you ever seen anybody raised from the dead? I've never seen anybody raised from the dead. They all die. One thing we know for a fact, says one minister on the radio, 100% of us die. This is what we know. So give comfort. Give grace. Be kind. Help them die with dignity. Don't try to raise them from the dead. Don't try to heal them. Because we've never seen a resurrection. No, no, there is a resurrection. Honest. I've seen a couple of them in my spiritual lifetime, says the Pharisee. No, no, says the Sadducee. That's not possible. But I've seen spirits. I've seen angels. They've appeared. No, 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 no. You haven't either. Those were hallucinations. Those were manifestations of the mind. I had a vision. I stood right there. I saw Jesus. I saw Elijah. I saw Moses. No, no, no. Those were actually apparitions produced in the brain by electrical impulse. Probably by God, maybe not by God, can't really tell. Don't know, wasn't there in their head. Oh, but you don't understand. We have an innumerable company of angels willing to help fight our battles. Oh, no, 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 brother. Now, wait a second. You know perfectly well it's the flesh we're overcoming. You don't need angels to help you overcome the flesh. All you need is good, strong humanity willpower and a little bit of accountability and a little bit of joining with the family and the brothers and to make sure we're all one in this, keep you accountable, keep you in line. You don't need any of that other stuff. But I saw the power of God. I don't know who he was. He was a guy. He walked up to me, touched my eyes. I'm healed. I'm doing well. If you think he's something else, oh Pharisees, you tell me. All I know is where I was, I was blind. I now see. Yeah, but how did he do it? In what way did he do it? Uh, his doctrine doesn't line up. His nature doesn't line up. He's not of us. Well, I don't know about you guys, but he made me see. <laughs> John 7.52 said, they're having a discussion. Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. It's not in the book, man. It's not in the book. This Messiah dude you think is the Messiah dude? It's not the Messiah dude because he didn't come from those verses. Don't you get it? There is no end time event of. There is no coming of the Messiah of from there. You got your doctrine wrong. You messed it up. Let's debate that some more. Let's argue that some more. And all the while we're arguing, we're powerless. We are Israel, prevailers with God, and we aren't prevailing because we're arguing. I'm not saying it's not right to debate the truth, to find the truth, to till the ground, to dig out the rock, to find the gold in the mountain, to find the truth. But I am saying that it's obvious to me now that too much of that, and we haven't healed anybody, saved anybody, raised anybody, slain any dragons. I know, speaking like a knight. The truth of the matter is, if I point any fingers, I have to point a couple back this direction, too, because I'm a child of those who were. I have seen the fire. I've seen the smoke. And I look around and I see the sepulchers, too. We don't want to admit that they're sepulchers. We don't want to admit that they're dead men's bones. They're good people. A lot of them are good people. But when it comes to the comparison of Jesus Christ against those people, you know... They never cast out a spirit. They never raise the dead, as it were. They never heal a soul. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, 
not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. See, knowing the scriptures is what the Reformation was all about. Power of God is what Pentecost was supposed to be all about. Tell me we have fully come into Pentecost. And I will say, show me the power. Show me your faith by your works, the New Testament says. And I will say, show me your baptism in the Holy Ghost by visible signs, please. My prayers to God are shifting. Your prayers to God should be shifting. I asked somebody the other day, have you ever operated any of the nine gifts? The reply was no. Then I said, have you ever asked to have any of the nine gifts? Long pause, and the answer was, no, I never thought of that. Was I supposed to do that? How many people never ask? You don't get spirit-filled unless you ask, and you don't get the gifts unless you ask, and you don't get the power unless you ask, and you don't get to manifest unless you ask. But you also have to want it with your whole soul. The fire that's in me is, let's want it with our whole soul. Let's go for it. Realizing that the church is stuck in debate. The church is stuck in the mud of debate. They're stuck in the denominational Sadducee versus Pharisee arguments. They're stuck in the Reformation versus Revival arguments. They're stuck. Some people have realized they are stuck and are trying to pull themselves out of the mire. And they are doing it successfully enough that every few months we have new revival books on the shelf. And I pick up another one. It always starts out the same. I was a minister of a church of this many X people. I've been doing it for this many X years. And I was just about exhausted. I was tired of people's problems. I was tired of people's difficulties. We weren't going anywhere. We weren't growing. We weren't dying. We weren't nothing. I was ready to toss in the towel. Even David Wilkerson, one of the most successful ministers on the planet, hopped in his car one day and headed down the freeway to Mexico. said, Lord, I'm done. I can't cope with it anymore. I'm finished. Got almost to Mexico before the Lord said, David, where are you going? <laughs> his story, not mine. Where are you going? <laughs> I can't take it anymore, Lord. If those who have a dribble of power, anointing, clarity, and sight are running away, is it any wonder that the rest are cashing in their Bible college degrees, their, their doctorates, their pastorates? You see, you just can't stay in powerless forever and not have your heart get shredded. 95% of pastoral duties is dealing with the negative of people. That's what I was trained to know. Would you like to volunteer? Yeah, but what about casting out devils, delivering and healing the sick and saving the... 95% of all pastoral duties. I'm trying to say that I think I see something. I'm not sure I like what I see. Some people get very tissy, you know, tissily. Uh, yeah, the God's going to have to tear down this church structure so that he can rebuild it right. That's all this stuff. That's the problem. We got too much red tape. We got too much bureaucracy. We got too much religion. We got too much, too much, too much. Pull it down. Pull it down. I say, pull it down. That's what I say. How about, let's try a different approach. Jesus didn't pull any of it down. The Son of God himself, who had the power to walk up to the local temple, stand right there and go, Disciples, I want you to understand this lesson. Temple down! <laughs> Could have done it. Fried it. Didn't have to go to the cross. Could have gotten right up to the cross, turned around, looked at the crowd and said, Behold the Lamb of God! Me! Boom! Blow all the crosses away. Could have done it. Didn't. No, no. He had a better answer. I'm going to come in meek, mild-mannered. And then when I flex my muscles, invisible things are going to run. Meek, mild-mannered. Well, I don't understand. How comes we didn't know he was the Son of God? How did we miss the fact that he was the Messiah? Surely if Jesus was walking among you, you'd know it, right? Yeah. There would be this effulgence. The halo would be about this big and golden and shining and tipped and turned. <laughs> like the icons show us, right? 
If Jesus walked into town, really walked into town, absolutely really was here, he'd come in on a triumphant horse and he'd set this kingdom right and we'd get it right and the people and these, these Amaharez Jews would go away and we'd have the conquering nation again in the days of Solomon. Yes, I remember the days of Solomon. You were dead. That was your great-great-great-great-granddaddy. You don't remember the days of Solomon. That was the revival before the revival before the revival before the revival. You're talking about old revivals. Ah, yes, but those were the good old days. Argue, argue, sitting on the debate lines. Well, how's he doing it? Is he casting out by Beelzebub? What do you think? Is he a man of God? I don't know. He seems like a good man. Doesn't seem like a good man to me. He seems like a deceiver of the people. Seems to me like, 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 seems to me like. And you wonder why the church is powerless. The problem is really simple. We have a whole lot of sports commentators up here in the stands and three or four guys down here playing football. And we're wondering why the score isn't right. Yep. Another one fell. Well, you know, if that quarterback had had a few blockers who knew how to cast out devils, maybe he wouldn't have fallen. Ooh. Sorry. A little bit of fire hiding in here today. Maybe if we had all the members of the body fully functional doing their job, we wouldn't keep having our quarterback sacked. Because you see... The adversary, Goliath, and his army have lined themselves all up along their hill. They have all their blockers up. They have their quarterback in place. They know the play they're going to play. They have the strategy worked out. They're going to run over that team. Well, I don't know if I should be doing that yet. I'm not ready. I'll just sit up here on the sidelines for another five more years and watch the church go by me. This is what the Sadducees did. This is what the Pharisees did. When they came face to face with the Son of God, they had no clue. They had been lost for so long in debating whether even angels existed. How could they possibly have spiritual discernment to see the Son of God? That's why they were powerless. The disciples, on the other hand, were ordinary fishermen who had not had their eyes blinded yet by the God of this world. And their hearts were still pure enough to say there is a Redeemer coming. And I hope he comes soon. <laughs> and when he did show up, they go, Ooh, did you feel that? Oh, yeah, I felt that. Thou art the Christ. What, I, you call me the Christ because I said to you I saw you sitting under a fig tree? Nathaniel? Nathan, whatever his name was. Nathaniel, right? What? Because I said to thou, thou art guileless, you know now I'm the Christ. I gave you one word of knowledge and you're ready to follow me for life? Greater things than this you're going to see, bud. You get where I'm going? The church world would just be satisfied with a prophet walking up and giving them one word of knowledge that's halfway decent. Then a bunch of Pharisees, Sadducees arguing over what should be decent. The problem with the church and what made it powerless was they became respecter of persons. Me, 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 we, 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 they, they, they. And no, he, he, he. John 4.44 Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Well, why not? Because we have this bad, bad, bad habit. We weigh the good against the bad. We look at the good against the sad. We try to figure out are you or are you not a man of God? I used to think that you were a man of God. I used to think that you were led of the Lord, but I don't anymore. I am in doubt of you now, my dear brother and friend. I am in doubt of you now, old pastor and friend. I am in doubt of you now, old church that used to be before you blew up. I am in doubt of you now, old revival that once happened and looks like it's happening again, and I'm scared of that, so I'm going to go to another church. Thank you very much. I can't afford this. I saw it once. I saw it twice. Some of us have seen it three times in our lifetime, the Spirit of God coming and moving and moving and moving and moving and then it dies and we go on. What makes us think we're any better than them? What makes us think that we dare to reach up for the brass ring of the power of God and actually grasp it? Surely we, but, we be but grasshoppers. We be but worms. We be but little peoples. Right? If a man actually stepped up and said, I'm a prophet of God and I'm here to tell you the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, God help you. 
we wouldn't even feel the fear. We'd go, okay, well, go ahead. I'll, I'll take it under advisement. Thank you very much. So then we ship our ministers over to Africa. We ship them somewhere else. Oh, mighty man of God! They come by the droves. Can't get your congregation to grow bigger than 250 folks. But you can step across the water and have 2.5 million people come listen to you preach. What's wrong with this picture? You know what the difference is? Over here, somebody shut up the kingdom of heaven so that they didn't enter in and nobody else could. And over there, nobody got to them yet. Over here, religion is nice and strong. Over there, a bunch of fishermen who don't have a clue, just hoping Messiah will show up and rescue them. What's the key to having the power of God in your life? Be a Pharisee? Debate it? Analyze it? Study it? Make sure that we confer it six ways to Sunday? Oh, that's just Anthony. Anthony does that. You know, he talks a lot. He preaches a lot. Oh, that's just so-and-so. You know how they are. You know, they're kind of that way. That's the way they've always been. Ah, but did he tell us the truth? Well, you know, yeah, there's some truth in there, I'm sure, but I haven't evaluated it all yet. Matthew 13, 57. They were offended in him. Whew. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. The Son of God shows up to Israel. They've been waiting for a long time for him. And they all go, <gasps> And some of them go, Arr! And some go, ah! And run away. And some of them turn green with envy. We can't let this guy continue walking around. He's going to take away our political seat. We've got a very good thing going on here between our, our 501c3 BDC status with the Roman government. We've got to make sure it stays that way, gentlemen. We really can't afford to have somebody standing up and honestly saying from the pulpit something that would have in any way indict Rome as being bad, wrong, or indifferent. We have to make sure that diverse view is represented correctly. This guy is messing things up, shaking things up, turning things upside down. We can't afford that, gentlemen. We can't afford that, gentlemen. It will cost us our seats. Well, you know, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, my son used to be a really stable individual, but then he got uh, hooked up with those Pentecostal types, and he really started doing some really weird things, started thinking he was, you know, a man of God, started thinking he was these other things, you know. I, I haven't really seen any fruit come out of him that would suggest that. You know, you know a tree by its fruit, there's no real fruit. So I assume that probably he's just gotten himself wrapped up with a bunch of people who are kind of a little bit deluded. Not really bad, they're good people, you know, relatively good people. I mean, I'm okay, I don't want to speak bad about the people, they're probably good people. But, you know, I'm that leader up there, that leader up there, now that worries me. See, people like that who think that they're really special stand up and start raising up churches and think they're going to do something. I don't know, that, that, that worries me a little bit. But my kid, he's okay, you know, I mean, he's not bad. He'll come out someday, she'll come out someday. No, I don't think we need to do an intervention. No, I don't think we need to do a rescue. No, I don't think we need to go do a, do a capture and pull. I, I don't think they're that bad. I, I just don't agree with their doctrine. Their doctrine's not quite what my doctrine says. My doctrine says there is no such thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's okay. That's my doctrine. That's his doctrine. He doesn't have that doctrine. She doesn't have that doctrine. Let's put that up at high speed in God's ears. Sounds like one of the windy tapes on the video. Look at the people go really fast. And God's going, this is a comedy. No, it's not. It's a tragedy. No, it is. It's a really bad take. Can we throw it away? Can we throw it away? Can we throw it away? Can we kill this? Can we just stop the tape? <clears throat> I want to start a fresh tape. I want a new tape. I want to start putting power in my people. If they can't handle it, I'll take care of it. They get a little wacky, I can always take them home. They get a little outside their calling. I can warn them a few times, and I can always take them home. Oh, no, 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 no. You might end up an alcoholic at the end of your life if you manifest the entire operating gifts of healing. Oh, no, no, no. You might end up destroyed. Oh, you might end up in a sexual sin. Oh, you might end up... Oh, you're going to... Ah! Ooh, boo! 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 I wonder how many sermons we get from the devil... 
I wonder how many teachings we're listening to that are so organized from the Pharisee spirits. I mean, do you really think that the spirits that ran the Pharisees aren't still floating around finding more people to make Pharisees? They were really good at their job back then. Why wouldn't they do it now? Same demons. Different name. Different flavor of the month. Different denominational title. Different whatever. As long as we keep the guy back behind the corner grinding the mill, you know, that Gideon dude, just leave him back there in the corner grinding. That's, that'll work. That'll work. He'll never be a threat to us. Those years of lives will never be a threat to us. We just keep them under oppression, keep them under, uh, under rulership, and, and control them a little bit. They won't ever have that problem. And we'll be safe. Until all of a sudden the angel shows up and says, Hi, mighty man of valor. How you doing? Who are you talking to? I'm grinding. <laughs> I'm busy. Hi, Moses. How you doing? Uh, well, uh, I'd like to deliver Israel. Accidentally killed an Egyptian. But, uh, hmm, I guess I'm not going to get to be used now because I really messed up bad. There's no way Israel's going to trust me again or Pharaoh's going to let me in the country again after I kill that Egyptian. There's just no way. It's impossible. My ministry's over. I know that God put it in my heart to deliver Israel and I thought I was doing the right thing by killing the guy, but... You know how it is when you're young and you're zealous and you know the gospel originally, you think you can just kind of charge in and take over and blow things up. <laughs> but after you make a few mistakes and you kill an Egyptian or two or you make a mistake over here or you, you know, backside of the desert, back by the sheep, hanging out on the hill, get married, have a good life, take Jethro's daughter, you know, let's take a nice quiet position here for 40 years. And church after church after church after church after church after church does that. Jethro sure has a lot of wives. <laughs> Spiritually speaking. There must be an awful supply out there of church buildings to rotate people through. Now you know what's really sad to me? Sad? Churches are now becoming police stations. New Age bookstores. So these are things I've actually seen. New Age bookstores. Take a good solid church Leave the building there. This is a good building. And turn it into an antique shop. Right? Have we not seen those things? Mm -hmm. Have I not groaned a billion groans driving by them when we have? Dead places being turned into trinket shops. Over here, strip mall, such and such, opens up the door of so-and-so ministries. What's backward here? The temple, the temple! Obviously not. Filled with dead men's bones. Shipped out the bones, threw in the demons. Shipped out the demons, threw in the carnal man. Shipped out the carnal man and said, hey, it's good real estate. And eventually, they'll take down the building and build themselves a condo. On property that was blessed by people who cut that ground saying, we claim this name. Let's land in the name of the Lord and for the demonstration of his image and the power of his majesty. And you just got to hear the devil in town through the, church, through the council going, <laughs> the council of the town going, ooh, that's prime real estate. We can make more tax money off of that. What am I describing? The consequences of powerlessness. The consequences of us not continuing in power as a church universal as a people, having said, nah, we don't think that's Christ. We don't think that's Christ. We don't recognize him. I don't know how many times I've read stories where Jesus has told somebody in a vision, yeah, I tried to visit there too, they didn't want me. Scary thought. The truth of the matter is, we have a cause. We have a cause. We have a reason to exist. We're not dead yet. <laughs> Amen. We're not dead yet. We may, may not be, you know, in the middle of spring sprouting our branches and our leaves and our fruit and everything so far out there that the whole universe can see this giant tree on a hill. But we're not dead. And we don't want to ever be dead. I'm trying to say, how do we get our roots down to find the source of water? How do we get all the way down, all the way down to the place where the power of God starts coming up through our veins. It starts coming up through our feet. It starts coming out of our fingers. It starts coming out of our eyes. We open our mouth. And it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And it's not a cliche. 
And it's not an image. And it's not a testimony. It's a demonstrable fact. Matthew 12, 39 says this, He answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. You want signs? <laughs> you can't handle signs! I stand in your midst and I heal you all day long. And you say to me, show me a sign? Are you blind? Oh, I guess you are. Are you deaf? Oh, I guess you are. Is your heart a rock? Okay, maybe it is. Show me a sign? And he did signs and wonders. And from that day forth he demonstrated his glory, the scripture says. Don't you get it? This is painful. This is painful. This generation says, Prove it to me! Prove it to me! Prove it to me! I don't accept healing. I don't accept deliverance. I don't accept falling in the spirit. I don't accept something. I don't accept, I don't accept these manifestations. None of these are true. Show it to me! All right, then you only get one sign left. Christ will return. That'll be your sign. Since you won't accept him being here, you're left with nothing else but his return. <coughs> and that's the one thing the dead church hangs on to with everything they got. Well, at least we know he's coming back. Yep, he's going to come back and he's going to be on our side when he comes back and he's going to be in our faith. We're going to be ready for him because we're the elder brother and we're ready for him. We're the elder brother. He'll receive us because we've endured all these generations against all these heretics and wildcats and wildfires and people who don't know what they're talking about. When Jesus returns, he will appoint us positions in the kingdom. He will cast out Rome. He will deliver us because he is going to come on a white horse and smash them all. Judgment is coming, praise God, and the return of Christ is right behind. And I will be sitting next to him because I have asked him to sit right on his right hand and his left hand. And my mother asked too, and she prayed, and my grandmother prayed, and my sons prayed. And we're going to sit right on his right and left side because we have endured. <sighs> Can I crawl under my pulpit now? Can I crawl under my pulpit now? No. Am I only bold because I can do it in this room? Do I dare talk like this anywhere else? Do we dare say to the church world, Wake up! Or do I have to preach all my messages at a volume that don't wake you up? Today, the Lord has shown me that the end of the world is coming. Now, for our homily, chapter 5, verse 3. You want a sign? I'll give you a sign. I've given you so many of them, the heavens are starting to shake. The earth is starting to act weird. The weather patterns are changing. What signs do you want? Do I have to shake the stars out of the heaven? I will shake the stars out of the heavens, saith God. But when it comes to that, it means you've rejected all my other signs long before. You, 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 we are supposed to be walking signs. Oh, I think that's putting too much pressure on the people of God. I think you're putting too much responsibility on them. Do you realize that you're driving them into the hole? You're going to make them feel very insecure. They're going to start feeling really worthless and like second-class citizens and third-class powerless people. You're making them feel terrible. Christ wouldn't do that. Christ wants them to feel loved and appreciated and cared for and watched over. And we're all one. That's not good psychology, Pastor. I'm not even sure you're a pastor. If you're going to talk to people like that, that's offensive. That's hard. Yeah. And is it any easier for a doctor to walk up to a patient and say, I'm sorry, sir, but you have lymphatic, pneumatic, pneumatic, whatever it is, all through your bones, and you've got two months to live, ten months to live, twelve months to live, you're dying. If you don't have a miracle from God, you're toast. Do you think it's easy for a doctor to do that? Do you think it's easy to say to somebody, 
I'm sorry, sir, but thou art possessed. <laughs> this day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Do you think that's easy? No, no, not you! Hast thou come to torment us before our time? Sit down, shut up, demon, get out of him! You think that was easy? Shake up that poor little congregation that probably had a wonderful synagogue meeting for 25 years, came in every day, sat and listened to the rabbi, you know, read the word, had a good meditation time, it was all very peaceful and wonderful, until this guy screamed! He screamed in the middle of a church service! How, how out of order! <laughs> And you started it by walking in the door. You're out of order. No, you're out of order. No, you're out of order. You're out of order. You're all out of order. God said do it decently and in order. Close the door. Lock the door. Throw away the key. Now we're back in order. Praise God. Praise God. Now, meanwhile, uh, what sign do you show us? We still need to know if the Lord is using you. So please explain to us exactly how it is you got and came about to that doctrine. Please. Uh, well, you see, I went through that door that you locked. <laughs> uh, I found a spare key you didn't know about. Went through the door, violently took it by force, and brought it back to you. Oh, you went through that door? Yeah, we went through that door. Oh, well, we labeled that door anathema a long time ago. You can't go through that door. But there's a room on the other side of that door. Yeah, but you can't go to that room. That is the dangerous room. That's the room where there's a whole bunch of weapons and stuff, and we're not quite sure what to do with those. There's people gone in, and then they, they pick up these really long, strange-looking things, and they slice their fingers, and they bleed all over the place. And spiritually, they just start acting weird and running around going, Ow, oh, ow, oh, that hurt! I don't know what he did, but it hurt! And then there's other people who've snuck into that room, stole the weaponry, walked out, slid right past their church leadership, gone right down the street, and said, Ta-da! Ta-da! And the demons went, Ah! And all of a sudden, here comes the chroniclers. You know, the chroniclers, the guys that follow right behind the second kingsers. And they say, hey, let us chronicle that. What happened? Well, you see, I ran into this room. I violently took these weapons out. I ran out on the street. I did something that never was heard of before. I opened a business called Deliverance Ministry in the middle of Texas. This is real. I'm actually quoting a real case. And I decided, hey, if Jesus did it, I can do it. Uh, there's the offering box. You want to be free of your demons? Walk in the door. I'll cast them out for you. Mm-hmm. I heard a man quoting a man who said of that man, never heard of anybody setting up a deliverance business. <laughs> <laughs> Only man I know of that made a business out of deliverance. <laughs> guy out of a guy out of Texas. <laughs> he ran it for about two plus years, and the Lord said, okay, good enough, shut it down, got some other things for you to do. Oh my, what signs do you want, O oh church? For God to convince you that he wants you powerful. Ye shall receive when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And you shall speak in tongues. And you will prophesy. And you will have visions and dreams. And your old folks are even going to have them. How about that? And furthermore, I'll add to the church 5,000 in a day, 4,000 in a day, 3,000 in a day. I tell you what, I'm going to send a man to a man who never heard of anything except that he likes me. And I'm going to have him preach to the group, the little family. And while he's preaching, I'll just dump my spirit on him. We won't even bother with the laying on a hand step, okay? Instant spirit fill of people. <laughs> Come on, Book of Acts, what does it really look like to you? Bunch of ecclesiastical, robed, pretty white sepulchers walking in, giving doctrinal teachings to make sure that everything looks perfectly fine. No. Peter coming in going... Uh, well, guys, I'm here for three reasons. Number one, I was up on a rooftop. Sheep came down, said, don't call unclean what I call unclean what I call, eh, whatever. Anyway, you guys aren't unclean anymore. Uh, two, uh, Jesus Christ came, and uh, I understand you want more of Christ. Okay, so here he is. And three, um, uh, hey, what was that? Huh? What was that? Uh-oh, they're speaking in tongues. Oh, no, they're prophesying. Oh, well, looks like they got what we got. I guess I'm done preaching today. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. I'm going back to the council to report this. Oh, James, who was I to withstand God? He did the same thing to them that he did to us. Want to argue about it? Go to God. <laughs> and James said, this seemeth good to us. Yep, it works for me. Let's get our book of Acts in perspective here. 
when God uses you in signs, wonders, miracles, and power, when God uses you in visions, dreams, when God uses you in the nine gifts, two gifts, seven, 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 uh, uh, excuse me, nine fruits of the Spirit come flowing out of you. And we haven't even seen those nine. Do you know that? We haven't even seen them yet. We've seen little trickles of love, little trickles of hope, a little trickle of long-suffering, a little trickle of faith, little trickles. We haven't seen the fruit that looks like this yet. For those people on the tape, it was really big. This size fruit. Not this size fruit. <laughs> you want a sign? I'll give you one. Jonah's belly of whale, Old Testament type. You can't even handle a straight doctrine. I'm going to make it shadow to you. Type. Type. You're going to use a type as a sign? <laughs> That's not doctrinally proper. <laughs> well, it's a sign. Three days, three nights. It was put in the book so you guys would know about me. Ha 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 He wrote it long before it's going to happen. Get the point. The problem with people in Jesus' day and the reason they were powerless, and I'm exasperatingly moving on, they loved the praises of men. They loved the praises of men. Matthew 6, 2, Therefore, when thou doest alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites, the people who put on masks, do in the synagogues and in the streets. I have an open street ministry. See my perfect mask? That they may have glory of men. Not everybody who's out there is going after the glory of men, I promise you. You can tell it, can't you? Can't you tell the Christian rock group when they're out there performing versus the ones that are out there performing? Can't you tell the ones who are, come on everybody, let's do it, do it, do it, let's ramp it, ramp it, ramp it, let's stamp it, stamp it, stamp it, let's bump it, bump it, bump Versus the ones that go out there, Lord, you're great, you're wonderful, sitting on the hill with the sheep singing my worship songs. And everybody goes dead still quiet. There's a difference. It's not about how the music's written, but it might be how the music's written. Is it written by the finger of God, through the ministers of God, through the minstrels of God, through the musicians of God? Or is it written, well, you know, I, I have my gift, <clears throat> and my gift is important to me, and so I have to make sure that I express my creativity, uh, whether in the church or out of the church, because God gave me a gift, and that gift is to write songs. And so I write songs because it's my gift. Which one's a window? Which one's a door? I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm trying to say, shake the cobwebs, man. This is insane. Shake the cobwebs and see the game. Get it right. We are headed for a new era. Oh, yeah. We are headed for, we better get this power flowing all the way. We better sit before God and just like when we got spirit-filled, say, I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. And if he says, you can't handle it, say, make me handle it. He says, are you sure? You say, uh, make me sure. <laughs> if he says, it's going to cost you, you say, uh, okay, no man's supposed to do anything except to count the cost, so give me the cost. What's the price tag? What's going to be my price tag? Ministers of God who operate fully have price tags given oftentimes. Sometimes the price tag is sit down, shut up, and don't say a word. You get to walk into the room, cross your arms like this, sit in the center of the assembly, and I don't want you to stand up, speak, or do a thing. I want you to sit right there, and I want you to go, get him, God, get him, get him, get him, go get him, get him, get him, go get him, get him, get him. Sometimes I'm going to say, get up and say it. Get him, go get him, go, God, get him, go get him. And sometimes I'm going to have you stand up there and say, nobody breathe. And we're all just going to sit here and wait. Go read your church history. He does it every which way he wants to. But the bottom line of it is, he says, I want to do the movement. I want to be the manifestation. I want to be the one. Now these people over here, here's what they want. They want to go, in the middle of the street, ladies and gentlemen, here come the almgivers. Do, 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 do. Tinkle, 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 drop coins into the big brass thing. Boing, boing, boing. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to show you today, we collected uh, ties, uh, what do you call them, uh, pledges, pledges, yes, ladies and gentlemen, up here on the big magic board, pledges, see your pledges, oh, thank you, brother, so that was a thousand dollar pledge, well, praise God. Uh, can I have mine not referenced on the board, please? I don't want the praise of men. I'm just going to quietly give to the church of my choice, to the home of my place, nobody's ever going to see it, nobody's ever going to know, my sacrifice. You see what I'm saying?
You see where I'm going? I'm not judging. I'm saying, look at the flavor of it. Feel the tone of it. Doesn't it strike you odd? Are we numbering Israel? Are we glorifying our tithe? Are we standing on the streets and blowing trumpets? Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't believe in those rich people out there with their fancy theaters and these, these evangelists with all their money glorifying. That's exactly what I'm talking about. They should all be stripped down and look poor. <laughs> we weren't talking about that either. <laughs> If God wants to deck out a prophet with gold chains around his neck, set him up in the middle of Babylon with his three friends, two friends and a half, whatever, and say, here, I want to make you soothsayers for King Babylon, do 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 You're going to be the advisor to the President of the United States, and he's going to give you a jet, and he's going to give you a yacht, and he's going to give you a whatever, and he's going to willfully tithe that to you, because you're now his spiritual advisor. It's his golden chains. Remember Daniel. Remember his friends. These were captives. People have been captured by Babylon. And these three guys get offered king's meat. Oh yeah, but they turned it down, don't you know? They didn't turn it down for the reason you want to burn down evangelists. Get your spirit right. Call fire correctly if you're going to call it. We need the power of God, all right. But sometimes that means then that the kings of Babylon might just actually put some gold in your hands because they recognize, like Nebuchadnezzar said, from this day forth, let everybody know that the God of these three guys, he is God. Anybody who doesn't pay tithe is in trouble. <laughs> anybody who doesn't acknowledge that I've acknowledged is in trouble. We gave them those rights back in the early founding of our country that they should be able to be non-profit for a reason. Because we wanted representatives of God in the earth. It was never for the reason of having non-representatives of God in the earth. Right. Meanwhile, in between while, he says, they may have, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Matthew 6, 5. First one dealt with alms. Second one deals with prayer. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets that they might be seen of men. Verily I say unto they have their reward. The third example is fasting. Matthew 6.16 Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they might appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. I've got to show you how much I'm suffering for the Lord. I've been on this fast for 40 days. Now I'm doing it for you guys. I'm taking the suffering Christ position. I'm doing it for you guys. I'm going to flagellate myself for the next month so that you guys can have the power of God. And sins will be purged from the church. I will lay on the form of a cross on the stairs and the steps of the cathedral for you guys. I will do it for you. I feel the compassion of Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me? Uh, I got a bum leg. Could you heal me? I need the compassion of Christ. Oh, I don't do that. I, I do laying on ground stuff. I don't do that. I'm sorry. Yeah, but doesn't God love me? If he loves me, wouldn't he want to take care of me? Doesn't God care? Oh, absolutely he cares, brother. I feel the compassion of Christ. I cry every day in the corner of my house for those. Oh, God. Yeah, though. want me to pretend to be anointed, I can do it, you know. <clears throat> or I can be real. I'm not trying to mock anybody. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm trying to say there's a flavor. I'm feeling that it. it's brewing. Mm -hmm. Which is it? Do you want form or substance? Yeah. <clears throat> Put on a mask, stand in the middle of the synagogue, and pray. I stand right up front in the church, Lord. I am not afraid to stand right up front in the church, Lord. My hands are in the air. I'm not embarrassed to have my hands in the air, Lord. I'm standing here. I'm not embarrassed, honest. I'm not, really. I don't know if anybody's watching me, but I'm not embarrassed, okay? Versus the other guy who walks up and goes, Oh, God. I don't know how much more of this we can take. Okay, I'm up here. What do you got to do? What do we got to do? 
What do we got to pray? What do we got to say? What do you want from me? I can't take it anymore. These people are in bondage. These people are rope tied and gagged. These people are... I got to lose something. I got to let something go. This is insane. Both standing in front of the church. One of them's going to walk away anointed. One of them's going to walk away appointed. One of them's going to walk away disappointed. When thou prayest, when thou doest thou alms, when thou fast, when thou doest anything unto the Lord, please forget about man. Forget about man. It's hard. We are men oriented. We've been trained to make sure we have the respect of our elders, the respect of our peers. We establish our self-esteem and our self-worth based on the words of others all the time. But then when God comes down and says, here's who thou art, we doubt that, question that, wonder about that, run from that, change from that. But if ten men and a people all in a row say, it has come to our attention that thou should be appointed as the next elder of the church of the firstborn. Wow, cool, far out, I'm appointed. And then God steps up and says, And I have decided that thou art now the prophet of those members of that council, and thou shalt speak the word of the Lord and only that which I give thee. Uh, well, I'm not sure the other guys are ready yet, Lord. Not sure that we can do that yet, Lord. You know, they're quite a little bit tone deaf, you know? <laughs> and I really don't want to be crucified. Please, Lord, don't do this to me. I don't want to be in that ministry. <laughs> so strong I feel almost schizophrenic in the way it's all flowing through me. It's like on the one hand you see the demons, on the other hand you see religion, on the other hand you see reality, on the other hand you see God, then you see the power, then you see the middle and you're standing in the middle trying to weigh all that figuring out how do I get anointed? How do I rise above all of this din, these waves of discouragement, depression darkness, deception dumb, 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 dumb. <laughs> I want to become the hand of God. The mighty hand of God. Have you ever heard that phrase? It's an old cliche phrase. Behold, he is the hand of God. She is the handmaiden of the Lord. Ooh. You know what, guys? I appreciate all you're appreciating me, but if my God doesn't appreciate me, all you're appreciating of me isn't going to appreciate me. <laughs> I will not get any better. Loving the praises of men rather than the praises of God, even the best of the disciples, the chosen one of the best of the best, the twelve, two of them, two of them, two of them got hit by Satan face first. Body block style. Mm, come on, Judas, you think you're a disciple, you think you're an apostle, you think you're going to walk with Christ? Come on, let's have a bad lover. I know what's in your heart. You love money. Wham! See those gold coins that just fell out? Those should have been given to the poor. See that oil that was spilled? That should have been sold and given to the poor. Do you see what that leader's doing? He's not doing a good thing there, Judas. Don't you think you need to take him down? He's probably bipolar. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all the people standing on the sidelines and the demons that are waiting said, Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You should do that. You should do that. It's best for the church. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But that's what you should do. You should take it down. Take it down. It's better for the sheep that way. Take it down. And then there's Peter. Peter. Poor Peter. <laughs> Matthew sixteen twenty three, Mark eight thirty three, Luke 4, 8. Turns and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. 33 says, When he turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Luke 4, 8 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Hmm. Get thee behind me? Get thee behind me. Two different flavors. Two different statements. Poor Peter. Poor Peter. First, he says to Jesus, don't get in my boat, I'm a sinner. Jesus said, not a problem, I'm getting in the boat. Then they're in the boat and on the storm. Jesus is walking across the water. Lord, if it be thou, bid me come. And he walks across the water. Oh, but he fails halfway there. 
sin. Get right up to the end of the ministry and it's, but no, Lord, surely this can't happen to you. I'm wiser now. I've been around three and a half years. I know what the future is about. I understand eschatology. Surely you're not going to die. Why? Because you want me around, Peter? Why? Because thou savorest the fact that you think a kingdom's going to come in? That's what Matthew 24 and 25 is all about, right? You, what, are you waiting for the appointment to sit on my right or my left? Thou savorest the things that be of men. You're looking for your church appointment. You're looking for your official title in the church. You're looking for your official function in the church. You've got to know who you are. No, Peter. No, Peter. I would never lie to you. This is the way it's going to be. Dead man walking in a nation of dead men talking. <laughs> got to be, or they don't come alive. Got to be. Get the behind me. Okay. Come all the way up to the crucifixion. Hey, you're one of those guys that was with Christ. I saw you. You were with him out there when they captured him. You were standing right there. You're one of his cult members. I know that. You were. You used to belong to that church. What was the name of that church? Oh, yeah. It was in the news. It was in the news a lot, matter of fact. Um, it was this church. It was, uh, it was a something or other. It was church of the something or other. A church by the something or other. Maybe it was a something or other of the church. Or, I don't know. Was it a chapel? Was it a church? Was it a... I don't know. It might have been a ministry. It might have been a fellowship. It might have been an evangelist thing. I can't quite remember. But you were part of it. I saw you there. In fact, I remember working with you 25 years ago. Didn't you say that God was all-powerful back then? Well, where's your God now? Does your God seem crucifiable? I think we pretty well took him out of the education system, don't you think? Weren't you one of those Bible-believing people? I mean, if, if Christ is so powerful, how come we can take Bibles out of the church, prayer out of the, uh, prayer, prayer out of the education system? We can, uh, you know, it seems to me like he's been captured and about headed for crucifixion. Pretty soon we'll have you Christians out of the way altogether! <laughs> oh, you're right. No, it wasn't me. No, no, I wasn't with him. I wasn't part of that revival. No, no, that was in a previous life. No, no, I see the deception of my ways now. No, I don't cast out devils anymore. That was a bad thing, bad, bad thing. I heard a lot of people, bad, bad, bad thing. No, no, I don't believe in any of that stuff. No, no, none of it. No, I was never of it. No, not me. You got the wrong guy, sorry. Yeah, I hung out with him. I visited him. I was with him for a little while. Yeah. Yeah, but didn't you go to the, didn't you go to the college? Didn't you, like, get a degree or something? Uh, no, 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 no. Through those notes way a long time ago. Thank God nobody knows I was there. I was close. Powerless people. Scared people. Fearful people. Embarrassed people. We've been mocked. We've been jeered from the beginning of time. The world is not worthy of the church. But they absolutely have to have the power of God. We can afford to die. We cannot afford to let God's name die. His glory will not go to another. We have to be able to stand up like Jesus and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. The Lord God only will I serve. I am not going to serve respected men. I am not going to, re going to serve in the chief seats. Matthew 23, 6. They love the uppermost rooms of feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. We cannot go there. I would love nothing better than to somebody come down. Somebody, please come down and recognize that I've been in this gospel for 30 years. Please recognize that I've studied diligently. Please recognize that I have the heart of God. And I really would like to see God do a major work before I croak! You know what would be much better? Be much better if this fireball that's brewing in me, bruising you, and bruising somebody else that you send it to, and then bruising somebody else, and out of nowhere comes a whole nother fire. It would be nice for me to just say, Here, I've gone up to the altar of the Lord, fire came down from heaven, and I hereby bequeath this to you. Holy vessel, touch it once, you are never going to be the same. And you pass it to the next guy, and the next guy, and the next guy, and we have ourselves a spiritual Olympic! Bring it on, guys. Bring it on. Okay, let's admit it. Let's admit it. We've all gotten stuck in the Pharisee court. Let's admit it. We've all argued with the Sadducees a few times or two. Let's admit it that we even started to meditate that maybe that door should be closed and the lock put on it because entering in was painful 
going through is painful. I have to admit, walking in the spirit turned out to be a bit of a windy ride. Yes, it was. Got up there with my hot air balloon. I was full of it. And I said, I can reach the heavens with this because God has taught me how to build my hot air balloon. And by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, I got up there. Son of a... Wow, I got up there. This is great, guys! I found the spiritual realm! And all of a sudden... Hey, where'd the black clouds come from? It was blue skies when I was here a minute ago. I saw the presence of God. It was mighty. It was powerful. It was great. What's that? Oh, my. Oh, no. Now my hair is blowing back like this. You know, my, my little hot thing is floating like this. I got to crank it up hotter to make sure that I have enough. I got to get away from this cloud. Run! <laughs> Tossed about by every wind of idiocy. Blown about by every wolf blowing on your little piglet house. I'll blow your spiritual house down. I'll blow your spiritual house down. I'll blow your spiritual house down. <laughs> okay, let's get it. Maybe hot air balloons wasn't the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a good way to travel on clear days when there wasn't no demonic resistance at high-powered winds. Maybe we built that structure okay, but we forgot some uh, rebar at the bottom and left out a brick or two over there. You know, you, we watched a show the, last night that was kind of cool, a, a monk show. And we're talking about this tall building. Oh, number, sorry. A uh, tall building and this big steel structure. And the only thing wrong with it was the welding was wrong. And the calculation came out at 60 miles per hour with the wind cutting around the building at this angle, that building will come down. It will hold on all of the conditions. It'll handle an earthquake. It'll take 90 mile an hour winds. It'll take this. It'll take that. But they cheated on the arc weld. <laughs> I looked at that and I said, oh, you did it again. Not fair. Not fair. Not fair. I'm not supposed to see things. Not fair. Well, obviously that was not a church of God. Did you see how fast it came down? Obviously that church was a bad building. Or maybe the people inside deserve judgment. I don't know. Maybe that's possible. Maybe they've done something to upset the Lord and they needed to die. I don't know. How about maybe we just didn't get the arc welding right and the rest wasn't a bad design, huh? Anybody want to consider those possibilities? Maybe what A.A. A. Allen knew was right. Maybe what Robert Slayer knows is right. Maybe what these other ministers knows is right. Maybe Zion City wasn't a bad idea. And maybe the revival in Brownsville, and maybe the other place over here, and the other place over there, and Knott's raising up the Presbyterians, and maybe Luther raising up the Lutherans, and the, maybe those weren't bad ideas. But somewhere along the way, the structure couldn't take what it was designed for. Even now, we're constantly redesigning our buildings to make them stronger, more flexible, more capable to handle the circumstances. But not Christianity. No, Christianity's got it all figured out. We know exactly how to build our spiritual work. We know how to build our spiritual brickwork. We know exactly how. We've been doing it for about 1,800 years. All you got to do is this. Build it with this. It'll always work with this. Uh, but, but, Your Honor, but, Your Honor, um, you built it on sand. Uh, not a problem. We've not had an earthquake in this region for about 1,800 years. But you built it on sand, and according to the blueprint book, if you build it on sand, you run the risk of it falling if a storm hits. Have you ever seen us fall? Have we not been around 1,800 years, 1,200 years, 400 years, 300 years, 150 years? Have we not always had a congregation of 150,000, 100,000, 10,000, 5,000, 3,000, 2,000? Why our little church of 500 to survive for 10 years, 12 years, 52 years? <laughs> we love numbers! until the wind hits, the wrong wind we weren't ready for, the earthquake that hit right through our fault line. <coughs> I don't have no fault lines. Plus God, I'm a religion. <laughs> I'm solid like a rock. See that sepulcher stone? <coughs> I'm sorry, but you have a fault line. Ladies and gentlemen, I offer you an opportunity. Pastor of myself, <laughs> I offer me an opportunity. <laughs> I'm, I'm sheep and pastor at the same time, you know. I don't get off cheap. What's the opportunity? Chance for redesign. 
chance for upgrade, chance for improvement, chance for quick change, chance for God saying, here's what winds are coming, they'll be arriving in about two years. Move it, 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 get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Not now, Lord, I'm busy. Not now, Lord, I can't. Not now, Lord, I don't see a reason. Not now, Lord, I don't see a storm. Well, are you going to be prophetic people or not? Do you want me talking to you or not? What, you only want me to tell you the pretty stuff? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you because he hath anointed you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon the body of Christ because it is the body of Christ. One head, one body. But right now we're doing a lot of flailing. <laughs> no, I can't swim, Lord. Please don't throw me in the water. <laughs> Fine. Get out of the creek. <laughs> You're in a creek. You know there have been people who have drowned in two inches of water? <laughs> you can drown in two inches of water. And your revival can die on three people. Your move can change on an arc weld. Your entire religion can collapse at the death of your leader. Unless your leader is God, unless your source is the mountain of God, the river of God, Unless your light cometh from the heavens and not from the flashlight bulb that somebody sold you cheap at the nine and dime at the religion house. Find your source. Find your source of oil so your lamp burns bright. Find your source of wick so that you can have a clean one. Make sure you trim it good and proper. Keep ready. We have to keep ready. And above all things, let your light shine among men. Okay, so maybe you're not too bright yet. You keep answering God's voice, and eventually you will see God's presence, and eventually you will flow in God's power, and they will see His glory. And that's what we're after. I will continue this message again next time, as if we didn't get the point yet. But we got the point. But I will continue it next time. Jesus... I stop right here to say, help, help. Thank you for this message, Lord, in all of its non-reverent style. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for giving me life. Now I ask, Lord, that in the same quantity as you've given us truth, you would also give us dunamis flowing, also give us the rest of the Pentecostal experience that 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians talked about. I ask Jesus that you help me to cope with it. I help, mm -hmm. ask you to help us to cope with it. I don't know why it is you first tell us our titles and then put us in boot camp, but that is okay. Help us to get through boot camp. Help us to get through other past camps that we've got to get through. Thank you, Lord, for the experiences you've given me over the years. Thank you for the experiences you've given the people around me. I ask, Lord, that you bring into this house the people who will petition God for your manifestation, your healing, your deliverance, your power, your flow, and your glory. Above all things, setting aside the praises of men if necessary, but manifesting that which is necessary, yourself among the earth. Jesus, I believe that your body is still a sleeping giant, not yet woken up. I believe it is a body that is wired for light, and right now looks kind of dim. But I ask you, Lord, turn the lights on. Shine brightly, Lord. And then, Lord, take us home, please. Get us out of here, Lord, before the next phase. Receive us to yourself, Lord, after having received us for the rest of our days. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you for this message, Lord. Help us, Lord, to walk in it. Casting off the shackles, casting off the yokes, casting off the things that have come upon us from religion, from bad experiences, from mistakes and sins and foolishness and wildfire and all the other things, Lord, that happen. Get those shackles off of us, Lord, that we might walk freely about letting you take care of the people. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.